In this video, I present a use case for sealed enclosures as I offer my take on the ultimate studio subwoofer. When it comes to places where I listen to music, this little area has by far been my favorite. Just a passive set of KRK monitors in the near field, backed up by some DSP correction and the upper one of these two amplifiers. The lower one, bridged to mono, powers a subwoofer along the opposite wall of the room. A 12-inch down-firing design that I threw together some 8 years ago and have stuck with ever since, gradually becoming preoccupied with what it doesn't do well, until eventually deciding to remake the whole thing from scratch. And given that I have no fancy new machines to unbox, today's video will be a salute to the ones that have already served me well and continue to do so. That being said, let's dive right into the project. And just to reason everything up from first principles, we begin with what may seem like a redundant question. What is the subwoofer intended to do? And while the answer could be expounded upon at length, it could also be expressed along three fundamental axes. Time, namely how fast the sub should react to an input signal. Frequency, defining the portion of the bandwidth along which the sub is to operate and amplitude, indicating the decibel level to which the sub will be driven along that bandwidth. These three factors inform everything including how much piston area will be needed, what type of an enclosure should be used, and what the power demands will be at volume. That being said, I am not discounting the existence of vanity projects, where the gear is the goal and thus no performance-related considerations are ever taken under advisement. Anyway, let's get some up-to-date readings of the two speakers without the subwoofer, and here's my custom DSP-corrected equal loudness profile with a 48 decibel proactive high-pass filter right at 50 Hz. This could be set as the upper threshold for the subwoofer, however, as I don't anticipate keeping the KRKs forever, it'll be wise to allow for some overlap bandwidth, say maybe 20 Hz worth, positioning the upper cutoff at 70 Hz. As for the low end, 20-ish hertz is where the majority of competent mastering engineers tend to apply a brick wall filter, so in order to distinguish whether or not they have or to make informed mastering decisions of my own, I'll want coverage down to about 18 hertz and there's the frequency component. Next, I'll want to establish the decibel threshold, in other words, the loudness of whatever the sub is intended to keep up with. For this, I capture several hours of a listening session, once again without the subwoofer, and the music playing as loud as comfort would allow. This averaged out to 91 decibels, beyond which the listening fatigue would take hold in a matter of minutes. So there's our amplitude component. Finally, on the topic of time, if you fancy yourself a hobbyist music producer, you may have a special relationship with latency perhaps spending hundreds if not thousands of dollars on a lightning fast interface only to cringe at the very notion that for every one meter that you push the subwoofer back, that's another three milliseconds of delay for the monitors, to say nothing of the fact that the sub will introduce its own group delay that has to be accounted for as well, ultimately putting speed above all other priorities. And thus, the three fundamental axes are defined enough. So let's talk strategy. Right away, this thing needs to be incredibly fast, which for a base cabinet means that 100% of the output has to emerge from the front of the piston. This is because the alternative vented enclosure, no matter the form, operates by storing and releasing the acoustic energy one full cycle after the incident wave. In other words, everything that comes out of the port is, for all intents and purposes, just a phase coherent echo or a reflex of the back wave, hence bass reflex. This also means that the sound emerging from the driver isn't immediately reinforced by the sound emerging from the vent. Likewise, when the driver stops, the vent still operates for upwards of another cycle. So why do some of the top tier studio subwoofers still have ports? Mostly to get around the very expensive problem of size. One of the major drawbacks of a sealed system is that it doesn't actually reinforce the output from the driver. Instead, it absorbs the back wave and dampens the driver with some degree of pneumatic compliance. So, to achieve even a modest 91 decibels at 18 Hz, a massive amount of piston area with a lot of pneumatic compliance behind it will be required to generate the pressure with no modal breakup, which, by the way, is what happens when the piston doesn't couple to the surrounding airspace, and rather than emitting a pure fundamental tone like this, 
it merely flutters at the frequency of the tone, like this. And we'll certainly have none of that. So, what I'm looking for is a large, substantially low efficiency bandwidth product driver, ideally by means of a very low free air resonance rather than a slightly elevated electrical cue. And with that in mind, I set off modeling every large low EBP sub that I could find the parameters for, including the 21 inch Kraken from Dayton Audio and a number of other seemingly choice subs ultimately settling on this 18-inch model from Acoustic Elegance. Here, 260 liters of pneumatic compliance, with the enclosure modeled across the room, should overlap the target bandwidth at volume and with less than 8 milliseconds of group delay even at its highest. Just for contrast, if we were to vent this enclosure, suddenly the echo from the back wave drives the output far past the target which just leaves more excess to dial back, and with group delay upwards of 30 milliseconds. People will wait for something good. Nope. Though, ironically, these subs are built to order, so this is literally six months after I bought one. And look, they even put my name on it. What's more, Sophie found the sheer scale of it quite fascinating. Anyway, a quick look at the actual TS parameters gives us a couple of things to adjust about the final design, and here it is. Nothing fancy, just a 271 liter sealed volume, with some line of sight bracing ensuring that no standing waves can form between the two furthermost walls, thus breaking up a destructive mode around 80 Hz. And with the sub 8 millisecond speed, I wanted the corner protectors to look like something that could have been designed by Lamborghini. Loud, prominent, and clever to boot. These are simultaneously carrying handles and feet, providing 20 millimeters of protective clearance in all directions, so if need be, the enclosure could even downfire. Anyway, let's get to making. And here I'd like to offer a massive shout out to Carbide 3D for keeping my Shape Oco 5 Pro in tip top shape. This thing has been a workhorse and the implied endorsement anytime I show it in action is quite deliberate as I'm genuinely happy with the machine and the hardware support that it comes with. Needless to say, everything came together about as precisely as you'd expect from a fully CNC cut project. I even found a new use for one of those masks. Afterwards, a few coats of exohyde applied by the Sophie, and this seems like as good a time as any for me to put a 3D printer through some shit. Not counting the Giga in the other room, which is its own thing, this has been my only 3D printer for the past several months, and it's just been fast and reliable enough to where I gave away all my bed slingers. So another shout out goes out to Chidi Tech for a job well done, and likewise for the hardware support. Now I'm gonna make this thing run for the next 288 hours with a nozzle at 240 degrees as I print 8 of these 36 hour PETG corners, 0.2 millimeters per layer. 40% grid pattern infill, and 6 perimeters all the way around. These are going to be absurdly tough, all but one, which failed on account of a power outage. And while it does have some extra give, it'll still take more before it shatters. So let's just apply a tiny little bit of a lot of extra force and there it is. Dang it. Anyway, the fully formed corners add up to 5.6 kilos, which breaks down to about 3 quarters of a spool per print. The terminal plate will accept a pair of binding posts, as well as the speak on socket, which I'm just welding into place. Oddly enough, the thing's been manufactured with air leaks, so once the binding posts go in and everything's been wired up, another blob of JB Weld seals the back of the socket. This just leaves the corners, each of which has been heavily dampened with blue tack, the terminal plate, and a bunch of this rockwall acoustic insulation with Sophie demonstrating the both guns blazing technique. Finally, after another 10 pounds of fiber fill, the 18 drops in flush, completing the build, so here's the original down firing design exiting stage left, and right away the hand grips on the new enclosure make for some effortless maneuvering even with it weighing in at nearly 200 pounds. Once in place, and with the subwoofer DSP settings cleared out, some early listening impressions already inspire confidence. Mind you, when everything is, once again DSP corrected, the new sub won't sound that much different from the old one, except for the ways in which the old one came up deficient, specifically with the modal breakup along that bottom octave. Strictly speaking, the only time that a new speaker should sound considerably different from the old one is if there was a lot wrong with the old one. So here is my finalized equal loudness profile for low to moderate volume listening and as a matter of a demo I'll play you out with some scales. First however, let's have a word about my previous demo. 
the one that to this day the majority of you cannot access without a VPN. Indeed, the entire Revo Point presentation had been restricted until I split the music off into a separate companion video. Either way, it doesn't appear to make a difference if I forfeit my revenue from any of these projects, YouTube is still inclined to restrict your access, which raises a question as to whether I should consider a different platform, continue with the hobbyist great music that I've produced, or explore some third and as yet undefined solution. So, be sure to rate the video as you see fit, subscribe if you're so inclined, and maybe chime in with your two cents about the demos. Speaking of which, here's something a little different. Alright! Hey everyone! Talking Head Pete here with a quick demonstration of audible flatness, ironically, delivered over YouTube and whatever it is that you're listening through. Now then, audible flatness essentially means that any tone generated at a set amplitude, say 40 Hz, should be the same apparent loudness as any other tone, say 80 hertz, and of course, every tone in between. Now, this is just an octave, needless to say, 80 hertz should be the same apparent loudness as 160 hertz, and so on in that direction. Likewise, every note below 40 hertz should also be the same apparent loudness, all the way down to 20 hertz, except in this case, also 18 hertz and 16 hertz. So, let me know in the comments if anyone's headphones are keeping up with what's happening in here. Cheers.